correctly for the vast majority of patients. But I think it came to me during COVID. So when COVID started, you remember everyone was told to wash your hands all the time. You had to stay in separate rooms in your houses, etc. And I was talking to a colleague from India on, on the Teams. And he said, you say, you say to stay in separate rooms when you've got COVID, but we have 10 people sleeping in one room. We can't stay separate. And you say to wash your hands, but you've got water. Oh, you've actually got water. And then you realize how blessed we are. Yeah. And, and in terms of gathering a perspective and, and sharing leadership amongst countries, how often does that happen? And what's some of the countries that you talk to? So most of the countries I talk to are where I've got colleagues who I know. So I talk to colleagues in India, in the USA, in Singapore, in Italy, in Spain, in the UK, obviously, in New Zealand, and also in the Western, the Eastern States of Australia, because there's a very different, it's very similar, but it's very different in healthcare setting. There's a much denser population, which makes it different. If you imagine West Australia is almost half the size of Australia, isn't it? So we've got 2.7 million people, maybe 2.3, 2.4 million live in Perth. So think, forget Perth, 300,000 people live in half of Australia. Yeah. That is such a vast landscape. And some of my patients can take two or three days going on the quickest means of transport to get to me for an outpatient appointment in Perth. That blows you away. So I try to talk to as many people as I can from different perspectives. We've twinned our nursing with Sing Health in Singapore. We're currently negotiating uh, a twinning with hospitals in India. And I think there's a great ability to learn from each other. But again, when I was in the UK, I twinned the hospitals I was with, with some very, very impoverished places in Africa. and. It wasn't so that we could just go and uh, preach to them how to do the right thing. And it certainly wasn't to give them a, a equipment because the equipment, they, they wouldn't have electricity, so you couldn't use it. But it was to provide education for them. And then actually a lot of our staff, we also sent there and they came back more fulfilled because they realize you have to make do sometimes and you can still make a difference. Yeah, what's that old doctor saying? Do no do no harm. That's the do thing. no harm. Yeah, Hippocratic oath. And whereabouts do you get your philosophy for leadership? You've got such large scale leadership in such high pressure situations. How have you developed your personal philosophy? I've no idea. I really don't. Look, I came very fortunate. I left school without formal qualifications. I was educated in Northern Ireland during the Troubles. I was an English Catholic in. A Protestant Irish school, which is probably not a great way to go. So I saw people being shot. I was blown up by mortars when I was a child walking towards a gym, not blown to pieces, thankfully, hardly injured at all. So I saw that side, but it really disrupted my education. So I didn't leave school with formal qualifications. I got a, an average job, and then I met a really inspiring person who said, yeah, I believe in you. I'm going to invest in you. I want you to train for five years and become a qualified accountant. In the UK, that is a big qualification. So I did that. Uh, I just had my first child. So I did my studying two nights a week by going to the night school. And every weekend I'd be in the library learning. I did that for five years and somehow qualified and got through with good marks and everything. And then I've been fortunate and I've met really great leaders all the way through who've inspired me. I've met a couple of poor leaders and they've helped me understand what not to do. But I wouldn't say I'm a composite leader. I think I try to surround myself with good people. Yeah, that's the secret, hey, the, the general. Absolutely. Just get good people and try also to trust in people. You don't expect to know all the answers. I don't have a clue about the answers, but I know really good people who will help me come to a judgment. And without having other people to really advise you of such a unique situation like that, how do you make decisions? How far in the future do you calculate those decisions and how do you navigate? And 
So I do have really good people who help me with all the decisions. So I, I would never go, very rarely, I can't think of an occasion where I go in blind, where I don't know anything and I, I, I'm not briefed or something. My people will say to me, the pros, Paul, the good things about this is this and the bad things are that. And we think this is the way it's going to go. And you kind of follow their advice. Or if you're not quite sure, so maybe you'll go and seek some thoughts from somebody else. And mostly the answers just become apparent. They rise to the top is the, the positives outweigh the negatives. And of all the options, this is the option. But you never think that you can get everything perfect because there are always consequences for every decision. Do I invest in that new piece of machinery? Yeah. Oh, by the way, that means you can't invest that other piece of machinery. Uh, do I put more investment into running more theatres for that specialty? That means those theatres aren't available for another specialty. So you're just balancing it up all the time. But don't assume you have to know the answers and listen to other people. From a medical industry perspective, what's some of the biggest challenges facing humanity? We've heard that antibiotics resistance is a thing or population collapse, population David Umber says population increase. Elon Musk says it's population collapse. What, from what you're seeing in the medical industry, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges that face us? So population growth is the first thing. So, excuse me, populations are growing around the world. The age of the population is increasing. I heard the other week that the first person to live to 200 has already been born. 10% of children, born, babies born today could live to 150 in a developed world. I think we've largely cured a lot of cancer compared to where we were 30 years ago. Now it's brain disease, dementia, Alzheimer's, etc. So all of those pressures, I think consumerism is a, a massive pressure. In the old days, you, you might be prepared to wait. Nowadays, I think less people are prepared to wait. I had in the UK somebody who was, went to their GP on a Monday morning the GP says, look, I'm going to send you an out. I want you to get tested. I think that might be a melanoma or a cancer. The hospital will write to you within 14 days and arrange an appointment within 14 days for you to be seen. And then they'll have 30 days if it needs an operation. By 10 o'clock that morning, the, the patient had rung the hospital I was running and said, when's my appointment? We hadn't even got the facts from the GP. Yeah. And then I found about it three days later where he said, I'm, I'm I'm writing to you or emailing you from my hospital bed in Belgium because I couldn't wait any longer. Wow. But for him, that was super important because the C word is like, that's the end of my life. Hmm. So consumerism is, is going to put real pressure on health services. The speed of technology. So some of the machines I now buy, uh, a Da Vinci robot or a, a Maca robot, they're millions of dollars for a number of patients, but a, a small number of patients. Some of the drugs, some patients could be on a drug that will cost half a million dollars a year. And that might even be for a long period of time. Mm. So all of those pressures. So I, th I think that's what we're facing. What we've got to do, though, I think is move in healthcare more towards true healthcare, which is not letting people get so sick. So don't let people get to a crisis before you help them. So I'll be obvious about it. People on the street are more likely to get sick, to get flu, to get pneumonia, to get other debilitating diseases. People in poverty, we know the experience of that and the impact on healthcare. People with mental health illness, if we could get to them sooner rather than allow for the mental health to grow with them certainly if it stems from something like depression. And then we obviously know about Indigenous health and the, the, the year's difference in life expectancy between them and Caucasian Australians. So personally, I would much rather get towards preventative health and doing far more in that arena. With things like the CRISPR machine and genome editing and looking at DNA, what sort of boundaries are you looking to push in, in Metro Health? So we have the Phenome Center, which is the world's Phenome Center. The Phenome Center is incredible. So if you took two twins and you gave them the same diet, it would have a different impact potentially on those twins because of the metabolism of them. 
So Fanome is looking at that and then looking at agriculture and looking at other areas and saying, actually, how do we kind of manage disease before it presents itself as disease or manage somebody's condition prior to you even realize it's going to happen? So the, those boundaries, genomics are the other side of the coin. So this is the history of where the genomes come through. So again, I think you balance those two and you've got an incredible tool for looking at a person's management way before we traditionally do, yeah. way before. I think a way that I sort of started thinking about your, your role as a coach, like you're the Phil Jackson of the 92 Bulls and you're trying to get some stars on the team to help your team out. What is it like looking, recruiting at people that are that brilliant, that level with those kind of resumes? How do you go about it? So we have a very open system of recruitment, quite rightly, in Australia. So I don't tap people on shoulders. You might let people know that certain roles are available and certain roles we might need to go internationally. But we're very fortunate in Australia. We have an incredible number of people who are brilliant already here. So it's a case of making sure they want to come to me, maybe rather than going to another hospital. So I'm just constantly trying to make sure that our, our hospital is known, all of my hospitals are known to be great places to work. I mean, there's some big names. You've got the Fiona Stanley was one of them, mm -hmm. people like that. What, how, when you're naming hospitals, how do you even consider that? Well, Fiona Stanley naming was way before my time, and that was obviously a government decision. And when I, when, when I spoke to Fiona, she said, oh, she, I was really worried because normally you only name hospitals after dead people. <laughs> so <laughs> she said she's wondering a bit of an omen, but she's an amazing lady. I've met her a number of times and just so inspiring. But you're right, we have the Fiona Woods. We've got the Rob Labiaster. We've we got just incredible. But it's not only those that are the most known, they're the most important. Some of our other staff who may be not household names do just the most incredible things as well. What are some of the private goals that you have for your current position? Oh, look, I, I just want to make sure that we are setting the bedrock for the future. I, I can't directly influence patient care in the way that our clinicians can, but I can try to make sure that I've made bids for the right facilities, the right equipment, the right strategies to help places in the future. So one of the examples is we used to have in Cambridgeshire some Royal Air Force operating theatres. They were built for the first Gulf War. They weren't used. They were then kept for the second Gulf War. They weren't used. I managed to acquire them and turn them into a day surgery centre. So one night at dinner, we had friends over. I didn't know about this. And the lady was regaling how wonderful this center was because she'd taken her son for day surgery and he had a great outcome. And I just felt as pleased as punch. I didn't say a word, but I was biting my tongue because I think I made that happen in some small way. And there's a number of other facilities I can go around. I know I, I kind of had an influence on them. Yeah. So... They're, they're the ways I think I can leave a little bit of something for the future for people to work in. Yeah, I've heard some really great minds saying that they've acquired everything that they needed in life, and now it's just thinking about legacy. Is that the kind of stage that you feel like you're in? Oh, look, I'm, I'm, not, that, I'm not in that type of career where I can leave legacy in the way that some people can. But if I can just leave healthcare with some positives that make a difference, then I'm happy at the end of the day. I came into healthcare from marketing. Uh, as I said, I, I took a pay cut to come into healthcare, but I thought it'd be more personally rewarding. And absolutely, that's the, the case. It's the most difficult, challenging job, but the most rewarding you'll ever have. And I keep saying I've got the best job in the world. Well, Paul Ford, and thank you very much for coming on the show. Pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Stories Within Stories podcast. We hope you've enjoyed the show. For more stories like this, head to barefootmedia.co.